Bonsoir, good evening. Uh, there's still plenty of people starting to uh, just registrating now uh, and getting some food. So we'll be a little bit late. Uh, we'll try to get them in as soon as we can. Merci beaucoup.
Good evening, bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Mon nom est Michel Tremblay, je suis le directeur du Goodman Cancer Center, ici à McGill. Uh, I'm the director of the McGill Goodman Cancer Center here at McGill University. So I'll take a few minutes to uh, uh, tell you a bit about who we are and why we're doing these evenings. Uh, and also, uh, immediately after, we'll start, uh, we have a, a brochette of scientists and uh, clinicians Uh, from uh, McGill University, which will uh, hopefully entertain you tonight, I'm sure about that, on uh, tonight, tonight is how cancer cells grow. And you'll see there's uh, several stories, I'll tell you a bit more uh, going on. So, just pour vous dire un peu qui on est, uh, le Centre de recherche Goodman est en fait le bras de recherche en cancérologie à l'Université McGill. Nous faisons de la recherche fondamentale, mais euh, en participant avec nos collègues cliniciens euh, at the MUHC and at the Jewish General Hospital. So, uh, really, we have four, four missions uh, at the Cancer Center. First one is to uh, uncover new pathways and new ways to uh, characterize cancer cells and also to treat cancer cells. So that's our first one. Our second mandate, really, is to train the new generations of cancer researchers. And we do this in our labs. We do this uh, by teaching and by uh, collaborating with different people. That's our second mandate. The third one is really to take the research that we have and try to translate this to our colleagues at the clinic. And this is not something which is very easy to do. Uh, I think it's difficult to do. Uh, it's two different worlds, the research, the clinic. And I think at McGill, we have a wonderful bunch of people which are really interacting, have exciting projects. And you'll see tonight a few examples of that where we, we are translating this research into clinical outcomes. So that's one thing. And the last one is what we do tonight, which is the uh, trying to explain to the public and also our clinician colleagues and other uh, administrators that, that research is the only way to go forward. Uh, without research, we cannot find new treatments, uh, explain what's not working, resistance to cancer treatment, for example. How do we deal with this? It's only when we go back and try to understand uh, these phenomenon that we can do better and treat people better. So these are the four missions uh, that we do. Uh, we do this by partnering with our colleague at the hospital, at the MUHC, at the Jewish General. We do this also with other uh, uh, scientists and clinicians at the University of Montréal, OCHIM, and the Institute of Cancer of Montréal. Uh, certain persons are here at the Institute of Cancer. Uh, and also, at the world, we have, at the Center for the Cancer Goodman, a partnership with the Weizmann Institute in Israel, uh, with the Berman Institute in California. Uh, with people closer and even further away in China and Japan. So we do all of this uh, for one reason, that we are passionate with uh, uh, cancer research and also the missions we have. And hopefully tonight we'll have a, a good opportunity to tell you what we do, at the same time uh, learn something and uh, see how, where we're going with all this. So I'm almost done already. Last, uh, the last, the first session we had, um, I, I was really hit uh, uh, by my colleagues. I spoke too long, and I'm, uh, it's probably why they took me as a director of the center. But that's another issue. So we had the first meeting we had was the cancer initiation. So we talked about for those which were there, and those which were not, we really discussed how cancer cells arise. Uh, so how, for example, mutations, how these mutations affect the genome and make cells to be pre-initiated towards a cancer, cancer growth. And cancer growth is our second topic today. So how can a cancer cell that you know, genetic event occurs, how can the single cell start growing and then becomes a much more uh, severe, uh, severe affair in, in, our, in our body? So we'll talk about filling cancer growth tonight, and I'll come back about the agenda in a, in a minute or two. We have two more sessions planned. Uh, the next one is session three on cancer metastasis, and you'll know that many oncologists and researchers believe that if you could just treat metastasis, perhaps we could eliminate the real risk and the danger of cancer. I don't think it's always the case, but certainly metastasis and invasions of tissue from cancer cells is probably one of the major cause of death and uh, problems with uh, cancer patients. So we'll have a session totally dedicated to that uh, in, on, on March 24th. And finally, I think we want to finish on a very nice note. Uh, on, uh, on session four, we'll talk about cancer as a chronic disease. It's funny to say that, but more and more, there's now over 60% of all cancer which are treated and cured 
Cure is a big word here, because we're talking also about survivorship. So more and more people survive their, their first cancer, survive even others, and continue to live their lives uh, in a very productive life. So our, in fact, aim in research is really to try to understand and bring us closer to close, closer po as close as possible to this outcome where we can live, uh, live uh, without fear of cancer. If it happens, we'll have tools that our clinicians can, can use to really make sure we continue to be productive. So this will be on May 12th, and again, I invite you to continue uh, joining us in those two evenings. So, for tonight, uh, it's a long program, as you can see. Um, the first one is almost done, it's me. Uh, the next person will be Julie St-Pierre. Uh, Julie will tell you about balance of energy and what, where in the cells, where in the cancer and normal cells this occurs. We'll talk a bit about that. We'll, this will be followed by Russell Jones, and Russell will talk about something which is very... Uh, surprising. In the past few years, uh, this gentleman called Warburg, which developed a theory in the 1920s, uh, and even at the Institut de Cancer, again, I'm talking about that tonight, the Institut de Cancer de Montréal, uh, Dr. Simard used to co you know, collect cells, cancer cells, in the 1940s, try to see if energy was different from a cancer cells versus a normal cells. And this kind of uh, disappeared with all the oncogene, the molecular biology, and it's about Ten years ago, I think, many people realized that energy is extremely important for cancer cells and for normal cells. And here at the Goodman Cancer Center, we've built in the past uh, three or four years an outstanding group on metabolism and cancer to look at this. So uh, we talk about broccoli and eating well, uh, but we go a bit further than that. We try to understand really how the cancer cells use energy and can we use this uh, to cure cancer. And Following Rusty, we'll talk about, uh, Vincent, will, Vincent Giguin will, will give us a talk about hormone and how hormone affects growth of cancer. And so, uh, again, on the theme of uh, cancer growth, this will be important. And Gordon, uh, another scientist of the Cancer Center, uh, will tell us an example of how to use energy to find new pathways to treat cancer and gives you a real concrete example of, of uh, a new medications that was developed through this idea. Um, and finally, our, our good colleague, Michael Polak, is an assistant member of the Cancer Center, but is, sir, is a clinician at the Jewish uh, Hospital at the Siegel Cancer Center. And uh, Michael has been a, a fantastic collaborator through the years, and he's joining us tonight to uh, give us more uh, information about uh, metabolism in cancer. So we'll have a question period after that. I'll try to be tough on my colleagues to make sure they finish this on time. And uh, I then wish you a good evening and you'll have all the time to, you have a little note, you can put notes on your, uh, your pamphlet. Don't hesitate to ask the question later on. You can ask the question to the person you want uh, when we'll be sitting down there and I'll try to, uh, again, give the chance to everybody to ask questions. So we'll do tonight a bit differently. We'll pass, compared to the first time, we'll pass on one shot all the evening. Uh, it should be about, as you say, if we follow our, our guidelines, and I'm pointing at my colleagues, uh, we should be around 8 o'clock asking questions, and you'll be free uh, uh, about half an hour, an hour later. So hopefully this is a good... There'll be still food afterwards. Uh, we're talking about metabolism, energy, and food. So after, after that evening, if everything is okay, you should not eat after, but we'll see about that. So... With uh, no further ado, I will ask uh, Julie Saint-Pierre to join us. Uh, Julie is a scientist at the Cancer Center, one of our newest recruits. And I think you have her descriptions of her. She did many things around the world. She went to, to England, Oxford. She went to also Harvard to do work. And we recruit her back here uh, at the Cancer Center in the Metabolis, Metabolism and Cancer Group. Sorry, Julie, I'm talking again too much, but look, okay. you have your own I microscope. Think, I think I have my own your own microscope. Did I microscope, yeah. Your own microscope. Bon, bien, bonsoir, je suis Julie Saint-Pierre, comme Michel a mentionné. Puis ce soir, je vais vous parler comment la nutrition influence le risque de développer le cancer. Autrement dit, c'est le lien entre le métabolisme et le cancer. Ça va me faire plaisir de répondre à vos questions à la fin euh, des séminaires. Je vais donner ma présentation en anglais. Vous pouvez poser vos questions en français, sans problème après. So tonight I'm going to talk about how nutrition affects the risk of developing cancer, in other words, the link between uh, metabolism and cancer. All right. So one central aspect of our well-being is energy balance. 
So what is energy balance? Energy balance means that our... Oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> All right, I'm getting it. Okay, so energy balance means that our energy intake in the form of food and drinks equals our energy expenditure in the form of activities and exercise. But in addition to activities and exercise, another, there is another component that is very important for energy expenditure, and that is standard metabolic rate, or SMR. And what does SMR mean? It basically means it's all the reaction that are, that are going on in your bodies right now while you are listening to this seminar. It allows you to think, to maintain posture, it allows your heart to beat. So even though you're not moving, you're spending significant amount of energy, and your body needs energy for all these functions to be performed. However, in many diseases, energy balance is altered. So you can have negative energy balance, which means that your energy intake is less than your energy expenditure. So you can see this in anorexia, for example, where your food intake is not sufficient. You can also see this in cachexia. Cachexia is seen in patients that are very ill, for example, people that have cancer or that have AIDS. And in cachexia, what happens is actually energy expenditure is greatly increased. And of course, prolonged negative energy balance can lead to that. But one more common problem that we face in the Western world with energy balance is positive energy balance. So positive energy balance basically means that our energy intake is greater than our energy expenditure. And this, of course, leads to weight gain. And prolonged weight gain can lead to obesity, type 2 diabetes, can also lead to heart problems. But what we're going to talk about tonight is actually that positive energy balance is a very important factor for developing cancer. And of course, prolonged positive energy balance can also cause death. So to appreciate how obesity has become important in industrialized countries, I'm going to show you a little movie that basically graphs the progression in obesity in the United States since 1985. So, obesity here is defined as about a 30 pound excess for a 5 foot 4 person. And what you can see is, okay, so here's the map of the United States, and what's reported is the percentage of the population in each of those states that are obese. So, when you have light color, like gray, you have less than 10% of the population in that state that is obese. The light blue is 10 to 14%, and then darker blue, 15 to 19, then the dark blue is 20 to 24, and when it's red, you actually have greater than 25% of the population in that state that is obese. So, we're now going to look at the progression. So, it started in 1985. Then we have 91, 95, 97, 2001, 2004, and 2006. So as you can see, there is very, very rapid progression of obesity in the United States. And actually, current estimates state that by 2015, 75% of the population in the United States will be overweight. And Obesity is now considered a top health threat, and it's very important because it's a risk factor for developing cancer. So for those of you who may think that we're doing better on this side of the border, I'm going to show you some map in Canada. So this time we're starting in 1994, and again, the light color shows basically a small fraction of the population that is obese, and the darker the color, then the greater the percentage. And when it's red, it's actually greater than 20%. So this time we start in 1994. And as you can see in Canada, most of the population were actually less than 15% were actually obese in uh, 
Canada. And then by 2000, we had the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, Newfoundland, Labrador, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia had actually greater than 20% of their population that was obese. And by 2005, we had Prince Edward Island just there and Saskatchewan that actually had greater than 20%. But it's also a factor, very, obesity is actually also very important in uh, Canada. All right. So my research program, basically what I'm interested in are mitochondria. So what are mitochondria? So there are these oval structure, plenty of ruffle inside. And basically they sit at the interface of this energy balance equation. So they're responsible basically for extracting the energy that is trapped in the food we eat and to give it to our tissue so that we can do our activities. We're just going to look a bit closer at mitochondria. All right. So here's a picture of a cell. A cell. Right, so this is the whole cell. Oh, oh. Sorry. I'm just going to go back. It went a bit too fast. Oh. Can I go back? Okay. Let's do it again. Okay. So basically, in orange, you can see all the mitochondria. And you can see they form a web. And most cells have lots of mitochondria to provide energy. And then what you can see here is a blown up picture of the mitochondria. But what's very important to appreciate is that even though you have this web structure and lots of mitochondria inside cells, mitochondria are very dynamic. So for example, if you were to start an exercise program, in your muscle, you would have more mitochondria because you need more energy to do that exercise. So not only you can put more mitochondria when you need more energy, but also each mitochondrion can be different. So you've seen all the oranges inside the cell, so these are the number of mitochondria you can have, and this can vary. If you need more, you can have more. If you need less, you can have less. And this is a mitochondria, and itself the mitochondria can also change. So I've told you so far that mitochondria are very important to provide you with energy. But mitochondria also play an important role in many biological processes. They're not only important to provide you with uh, energy, but also they're responsible for many things. Of course, I'm not going to discuss what's going on there, but it's just to show that many things are actually happening inside the mitochondria. They're responsible, for example, when a cell is dying, it's part of that process. And also when cells divide, proliferate to make new cells, you need to make new components to make these new cells. And mitochondria also play a very important role in that. So we're interested in energy balance and cancer. So I've mentioned to you that obesity increases the risk of developing cancer. But not only that, in cancer survivors, obesity increases the risk of recurrence and also reduces survival. But what's very interesting and very important is that actually cancer cells, they have a different metabolism. Their mitochondria function differently. So I've told you like, that they're very important for energy production, and it's known that in some types of cancer, the mitochondria are actually producing less energy than they're supposed to, and also, there are all these other reactions that I've shown you that could be modified. So I'm interested in understanding all these pathways in normal cell and in cancer cell, and how this is uh, important for uh, cancer and the risk of developing cancer. And my next colleague, Dr. Russell Jones, is going to talk to you a bit more about how cancer cells have a different metabolism. That's it. <laughs> I was, in fact, very impressed that uh, the lo I lost weight uh, re recently, and Quebec remains in the 14 percent. <laughs> so that's, a, that's another thing. So uh, Rusty Jones is uh, also a recent colleague to the Cancer Center. Uh, you came about a year ago, about. 
uh, initially from Ontario, went to Philadelphia, worked in a lab very famous for his work, its work on uh, metabolism and cancer. And uh, he was with Michael, one of the few early people talking about metformin and cancer. Metformin is a diabetic drug, and uh, Rusty will tell us a bit more about what the difference between uh, cancer cells energy usage versus the normal cells. Thank you, Rusty. Thank you. Okay, as Michelle, <clears throat> excuse me, as Michelle mentioned, my name is Russell Jones, and uh, I'm an assistant professor at the, uh, at the Goodman Cancer Center, as well as part of the Department of Physiology here at McGill University. And uh, il me fait plaisir de parler avec vous ce soir sur un uh, sujet très important dans le cancer, et ça c'est uh, comment le cancer se nourrit, how cancer feeds itself. And as, as uh, Michelle mentioned, I actually studied, uh, the, was fortunate to study in one of the world leading labs that actually studies cancer metabolism and how cancer cells fuel themselves. That's Dr. Craig Thompson at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And it's very funny because we in the cancer metabolism field laugh because this is actually a very old field. As Michelle mentioned, Otto Warburg uh, first identified uh, his findings on, uh, on sugar metabolism in cancer cells back in the 20s. And this sort of interest in this subject died off for several, several years, in particular to the onset of the field of molecular bio biology in the 70s, where uh, scientists actually could identify specific genes which were involved in the onset and initiation and progression of cancer. But what the interesting thing is, is that now in, 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 the, in the 21st century, what we're finding is, is that a lot of the genes that are involved in regulating cancer development and progression also are, are intricately involved with fueling cancer and controlling cell, um, cancer cell metabolism. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is about this subject. Now, as Michelle mentioned, cancer is essentially a disease in which the normal restrictions on cell growth and proliferation, that cell division, are become unglued. So most of the cells in our, or many of the cells in our body, there are self-imposed restrictions on their ability to grow and divide. However, in cancer, the breaks on this that keep a cell from growing and dividing out of control are removed. And so one single initiating tumor cell can then divide and become a growing, um, growing cancer, which, if not for therapeutic intervention, uh, can lead to the formation of a solid tumor. Now, here in this uh, cancer model that we all um, know about, is an inherent problem from the perspective of cellular energetics. And I like to call this the metabolic challenge. So think of this single tumor cell. What we're saying is, is that in cancer, the brakes come off. The foot is on the gas pedal, and this cell is going to divide and form two cells. And then su subsequently, these two cells will divide to make four cells, and on and on to form a solid tumor. Now what we're essentially saying here is this cell now gains the ability to duplicate itself. And if we think of this in terms of, a, of construction, this is a major engineering feat. Essentially what we're saying is this cell has to amass all of the energy and all of the resources, the building blocks it needs to essentially replicate all of its genetic material, duplicate all of the proteins and membranes that make up the cell to then divide and make two cells. This is like building a skyscraper every single day. Yet it happens, and it happens quite readily. And so what an important problem when we consider cancer growth is how cancer cells regulate their metabolic needs. And that basically comes down to two main things. How cancer cells gain and acquire energy, the actual fuel, to help them perform the bi their biological reactions, and as well, how do they get raw materials. And we think about raw materials not in terms of mortar and bricks, but in terms of nutrients. So glucose, sugars, amino acids, and the like. So really what my lab is interested in, and in particular the metabolism and cancer group, here at McGill University, is how do cancer cells fuel their growth? And unlike my son, who fuels his growth through eating hot dogs and apple juice, cancer cells, as Julie uh, St. Pierre mentioned, modify their metabolism in a specific way which allows them to grow unchecked. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of these today with you. The first thing that cancer cells tend to do in order to meet their nutritional requirements is to actually increase their nutrient uptake. Now, what do I mean by this? I think it's best illustrated by a picture. 
So let's take a picture here of a B-cell lymphoma. A lymphoma this is a, 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 a blood cancer from of B-cell origin. And what you'll notice here, what we're doing is we're actually looking at a collection of these lymphoma cells. And what you see here that lights up in this slide are actually nutrient tra transporters on the surface of these cells. Now normally cells have a very low and regulated number of these nutrient transporters. These in particular are, bring amino acids into the cell. And these nutrient transporters get massively, massively upregulated in cancer cells. And effectively, this allows cancer cells to take in more nutrients, essentially the building blocks that they need to make energy and to build more cells. Another particularly interesting thing about cancer cells is that they actually become dependent on, the majority of cancers become dependent on glucose or sugar for their growth. So in a normal cell, where you have a normal uh, cell that's non-cancerous, we'll take up glucose because glucose is the major carbon source that we use, cells use to make energy. A normal cell will have a sort of a, what we call a basal, a base level of, of uh, sugar that it uses to run all of its biochemical reactions. But in a cancer cell, they really, really ramp up their, both their uptake of glucose and the way they process it so they can make more energy and more building blocks in order to fuel cancer growth. And getting back to this fellow that we've been talking about, uh, touching on uh, in the last half hour, this was first identified again back in the 20s by this uh, German uh, biochemist known as Otto Warburg. And what uh, Dr. Warburg actually found is that while normal cells actually channel um, nutrients such as sugar into the mitochondria, as Julie mentioned, to make lots of energy, cancer cells are very different. They don't do this in the same way that normal cells do. Warburg himself actually observed that cancer cells in addition to taking up lots and lots of more sugar than a normal cell does, they process the sugar differently to make energy. And to do this, they use a pathway known as glycolysis. And not to get too technical, but just in the, I want to provide you with the essence of what this actually means for a cancer cell. So we take this as a cell membrane, and here's the mitochondria. As Julie mentioned, this is the furnace of the cell that takes nutrients and different um, raw materials and process them, processes them to make energy. Well, glucose is one of these raw materials that a mitochondria uses to make energy. So in a normal cell, you'll take glucose, essentially sugar, transport it into the cell, and it gets to the mitochondria through, mainly through one pathway. And that's this pathway called glycolysis. What glycolysis is, is essentially is a series of chemical reactions that reduces glucose into a, a smaller form of carbon known as pyruvate, and pyruvate essentially is the gas that gets pumped into the mitochondria to generate energy. Now there's also a little bit of energy that's actually generated from glycolysis, and actually you may know glycolysis because um, glycolysis is a, ma is a major way that we make energy in muscle cells, burning sugar in, in, um, during exercise. So interestingly, in most resting cells in our body, only 5% of our energy is actually generated from glycolysis, and most of it comes from the mitochondria. And cancer cells are very different. Effectively, this gets turned on its head. And so you have almost 90% of the energy in a cancer cell being generated from this pathway called glycolysis, and there's much less reliance on the mitochondria for energy production. And why cancer cells do this is a major, major question for us studying how cancer metabolism is regulated. Uh, and some of the theories that are out now is it's, this pathway is not just important for energy production, but also for making more um, raw materials and building blocks to help fuel cancer growth. And what's very interesting is that many of the common mutations that we've been studying over the last 30 or 40 years that play prominent roles in cancer initiation and progression are also involved in promoting this essentially what is sugar addiction. So if we take a couple, not to throw out uh, um, an alphabet soup at everyone, but there are some prominent tumor suppressors and oncogenes that are uh, commonly mutated in cancer, which play a prominent role in regulating this Warburg metabolism. In particular, a tumor suppressor known as P53. This is mutated in over 50% of all human cancers, and it's involved in regulating this pathway. As well, PI3 kinase, through the human genome sequencing, cancer sequencing uh, projects, has been found to be the most prevalent activating mutation in cancer across a number of cancers. 
And it is intricately involved in regulating sugar addiction in cancer cells. Now, there are other things that, um, so we talked about this sugar addiction in, in, in cancer cells, and this actually open, uh, opens up a very interesting point for us, both as cancer scientists and clinicians, to take advantage of this essentially um, dependence on glucose metabolism or sugar metabolism for both cancer identification, uh, diagnosis, and ultimately treatment. And a great example of this is the PET scan. I'm sure many of you have heard this, but in actual fact, PET scanning is an amazing visualization technique that doctors use to detect cancer. It's a full body imaging technique that takes advantage of this high rate of sugar usage by tumors to essentially see the cancer by this, uh, taking advantage of their ability of cancer cells to take up sugar. So essentially in this diagnostic technique, patients are given a chemical known as FDG, or fluoro 2 deoxyglucose and essentially what this is is a sugar analog. It looks like sugar. Cells in our body think it's sugar, okay? So FDG, it actually looks like glucose and it's taken up by tissues in our body that want sugar. And so, of course, many normal tissues will take up sugar. You'll look at the, this PET scan on the, on, the right, on the left here and you'll notice the heart is a prominent um, user of sugar and it lights very brightly in a PET scan as well as the brain. But the interesting thing is, is because Tumor cells can preferentially take up glucose. They can also be visualized, visualized by this technique. And so I just want to give you an example of this. Again, this is a PET scan here. And what you'll notice is the heart and the brain um, take up glucose at a very high rate. Again, this glucose, this labeled glucose, is, is um, expelled from the body through our kidneys and, and uh, the urinary tract, so you'll actually see a bit of the radial label glucose in the kidneys and certainly down here in the bladder. But what I'd like to point your attention to is up here in this left underarm region here is a, is a cancerous lymph node. I'm just going to run this movie here so everyone can see it a little bit better. There we go. And then you can actually see in a 3D representation, I'm just going to point it right here, Using combination scans of PET scans and CT scans, you can actually get a three-dimensional image of the body. I mean, this will soon be coming to an airport near you. Um, <laughs> but this actually is a, is a great advantage to, to clinicians because it can be used in a, for a variety of techniques. Many uses in medicine. One, for detecting cancers. So this is a good screening technique um, to find highly glycolytic tumors, as we call them. But as well, it's very important in cancer therapy, what we call staging cancer. This is essentially can be used to map out where cancer is in the body by using these imaging techniques. And as well, it's a very important uh, technique used to track patients' response to therapies because the um, responsiveness to the chemotherapy is very closely related to its ability to do this type of glucose metabolism. And what's very interesting is fully 70% of all characterized tumors uh, can actually be visualized by this technique. So I just want to give you an example of, of the, the idea of for therapeutics. I want to show you here on the left, this is a PET scan of a, a patient from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute who has liver cancer. And what you'll see here in this uh, combined PET scan, CT scan, this tumor, liver tumor, which takes up a high amount of glucose. And it can be visualized by this technique. The patient was then actually given a chemotherapy treatment and you'll see here on the right, you can actually track the, um, how well the treatment is progressing by looking at the loss or, uh, of this type of signal. So it's a very important tool, this preferential use of sugar by cancers for both diagnosis and for tracking therapy. So I just want to leave you with this idea. My lab uh, here at McGill is very interested in studying how cancer cells regulate this pathway, how they use sugars and for energy production and for cancer growth. And we're trying to take the knowledge that we're learning here to think about possible therapeutic uh, interventions. And uh, hopefully we'll hear more about this later today uh, with uh, Gordon Shore and Michael Pollack will be touching on the idea of intervening in cancer through uh, cancer, um, uh, cancer metabolism. Um, but I think this is one, represents one of the most exciting new developments in um, cancer uh, therapy going forward um, in the 21st century. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rusty.
and uh, we'll have Vincent Gigard talking. So we, we talk a bit about energy, sugar. Uh, Vincent will bring another aspect. And I'm sure um, uh, I can tell you a little personal thing. My mom uh, died of breast cancer uh, many years ago after uh, having those hormonal injections. Uh, we still never know if that will be the, the trigger of her breast cancer or not. And uh, however, we know now uh, definitively that in, in animal models, uh, in cells, and also in patients, uh, hormones plays a very important role in the growth and fueling of cancer. And Vincent is an expert on this. He's also one of the key person in this metabolism and cancer group that we're building. And uh, we'll welcome you, Vincent. Thank you. Merci. Uh, bonsoir. Merci d'être venu nous entendre et nous écouter. C'est très... Uh, <coughs> très plaisant d'avoir une, une aussi grande audience. Uh, <coughs> donc, uh, ce que je vais vous parler ce soir, c'est hormones et cancer. Uh, I will discuss the role, I mean, we just saw that the cells need energy to grow, but also the cells don't think by themselves most of the time. The cells need signal, they need to instruction uh, in order to uh, <coughs> be able to uh, take up energy and use energy and so on. So uh, these signals usually come from hormones, and I will explain to you a little bit uh, how uh, hormones can affect uh, cancer. <clears throat> so <clears throat> our bodies are full of hormones, and you know that, especially when you're a teenager. Uh, we all know that. And, uh, and in fact, they tell you, they tell the cells what to do, and... Uh, <clears throat> They tell the not only uh, they tell the cells what to do, but uh, when you're a teenager, they also tell the whole body what to do, and uh, and what not to do. And um, but hormones are very very essential, in fact, because naturally they are required for uh, reproduction. Uh, they are also required for normal growth. So if you want to grow, like from a baby to an adult, uh, you need hormones to tell the cells to grow, to divide, and so on. And also, they are required for day-to-day -day maintenance of the organism. So, like I said, it tells you when to eat, uh, when maybe to go to sleep, and so on. So, you need those hormones to tell you what to do, to do what the organism needs to do. Okay. <clears throat> and although these hormones are required, the problem is that even naturally occurring hormones can, can increase your risk of cancer. And, and this is done because they can encourage transform cells, so the cancer cells that we saw, the single cancer cells that we saw in the previous talk, to grow and divide more quickly. So this is the hormones that tells the cells to do what Rusty and uh, Julie explained before. And it's very important, the hormones are very important because 35% of all newly diagnosed cancer in males are hormone dependent, so they require really hormone to grow, and in women it's even more, it's 50%. So 50% of cancer in women are what we call hormone dependence, so they require hormones to grow. So what is a hormone? So what is a hormone is that it's a naturally occurring substance, so it's something that we, we make ourselves, and usually it's made by a gland, so a gland like the thyroid gland, or the pancreas, or the adrenal gland, or the testis and ovaries. And these hormones, what they do is that they are produced in one place, like in the testis, like androgen, and androgen usually are required for muscle to work, to grow. And you all have seen the photo of, <clears throat> of Barry Bonds when he was young and Barry Bonds when he was the king of home runs. I mean, because he was under androgen, uh, growing his muscles with androgen. So this is, could be good. You need that. But <clears throat> uh, so hormones also not, can not only be made by gland, but also they can also come sometimes from non-endocrine tissue, and, and importantly, from fat. And that will have a big connection later on. Okay? So what hormone ours are, in fact, are chemical messenger. So they are messenger because they start from one area in the body and they go somewhere else to tell the organ, like muscles, the brain, wherever, and the breast, and so on, to do what they have to do. Okay? And <clears throat> so. So again, some of the best known hormones, we, I think we all know them are the sex hormones, so estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, okay? And if you look here, this is the structure of those hormones. We don't want to go into the details, but you see that this is estrogen, 
and this is hormone, the thyroid hormone. So those are very, very small molecules, in fact, very, very tiny, a little bit, in fact, not much bigger than glucose and so on. So it's a very, very small molecules. We also have big hormones like insulin, and insulin is known to control blood sugar level, and we just saw how important uh, sugars are important in cancer growth. But they are no, but, uh, not only known to control blood sugar level, but also they are known to uh, influence the growth of cells directly. And we'll learn a little about that also. We'll discuss that with Dr. Pollack later on. Not only we have in, hormone like insulin, but also we have vitamins, vitamins that we ingest also, vitamin A and vitamin D. And vitamin A and D, in fact, work just like the sex hormones. And you see why? Because this is vitamin A. And vitamin A looks a lot like thyroid hormones, which is secreted by thyroid gland, or even like estrogen. So it's not a big hormone like that. It's a very small hormone. In fact, work exactly like those guys. <clears throat> so how exactly do hormones work? And this is what we do in my lab, what we do, the kind of research that we do. We're trying to find out how a very small molecule like estrogen, very, very small, how can a small, small <clears throat> molecule like that can transform uh, um, a young girl into a woman, okay? The same thing with testosterone, transform a boy into a man. This is a very important process, but this is done by a very, very small hormone. And how they do that, in fact, is that the sex hormones, because they are small and they look like a lipid, they can cross the membrane freely, okay? They come in from the blood and they enter the cells freely. And then, but that's really too small to do anything. So then what they do is that they interact with very specific protein, what we call receptors in the cells. And these protein, in fact, go directly into the nucleus of the cells and interact with the DNA, with the genetic code. And what it does is that it tells the hormones then, the very small hormones by interacting with this bigger protein, are able then to tell the cells which genes to turn on, which genes to turn off. And many of the genes that are turned on, are in fact, are, will make protein that themselves are required for the growth and the division of the cells, of the normal cells. And also they will make protein that will be excreted out of the cells and those will be like growth factors, like IGF and, and other growth factors. And they will tell the cells, to, the other cells next door, to grow and divide. So you can see easily if something goes wrong in the system that it could influence cancer. Okay? And the big hormones like insulin, they cannot enter the cells. They're too big for that. They, they cannot cross the membrane here. So what they do is that they interact with receptors, but those receptors are on the cell surface. And then they send signal that will all go down to also uh, tell some protein in the nucleus and also outside of the nucleus also uh, to um, tell the cells to grow and divide. And the same thing is true for drugs and vitamin, or vitamins, like vitamin A and vitamin D. Here they come from the outside because it's something that we eat, but, but again, they interact in the same way. And in fact, like, a drug, like vitamin A, it's a very important uh, uh, <clears throat> molecule, in fact, to help the embryo grow from a... Uh, a one cell stage embryo to a baby, a full baby, you absolutely need vitamin A to do that. So you can see again a, a, a molecule that's so important for the growth of, of uh, from a single cells to a full grown babies will be also probably important in the growth of cancer cells. And in fact, in some kind of leukemia, you can cure leukemia just by using vitamin A, by which we're using <coughs> the derivatives of a vitamin A. So how do hormones affect cancer risk, okay? So usually in the day-to-day -day life, our hormone levels are carefully controlled because they have to be, because if they are not, you see something bad can happen. So if they are too high, if they really have too much hormones, or in fact the, the system is defective, they can make your cells grow and divide uncontrollably and stop them from dying from damage, like induced by mutation. So the hormones themselves don't cause cancer. Okay? They don't cause directly cancer. What the cancer is caused by, is, as we, we learned a lot before, is by <clears throat> specific mutation in the DNA, some gen germline mutation, some mutation that we're born with, and then we acquire a different set of mutation with error that goes on in our life, in the cells. And then once the cells has accumulated all these problems, all these mistakes, the cell doesn't know if it has to grow or not. But then if there is a hormone that comes in and tells the cells, yes, you can grow, then you can have a cancer. 
because now the defective cells have the signal to grow, and, and it will produce the cancer. Okay. So, how do hormones affect cancer risk again? Woman with, it's known that women with high level of estrogen have twice the average risk of breast cancer and uterine cancer, which are fueled by estrogen. Also in men, prostate cancer cells are totally dependent on testosterone to grow and divide, at least in the first stage of the cancer. Okay. <clears throat> like I said before, insulin also, the insulin which controls blood sugar level, it's known that high level of insulin and insulin growth factors have been linked to many types of cancer, like colon, uterine, pancreas, and kidney cancer. And, and so, as I told you, the way it works is simply that the cancer cell exists, but it doesn't know what to do. But when estradiol, like in breast cancer, and uterine cancer comes in, it tells the cells, oh, why, why not uh, grow? Because this is the normal thing that estrogen do normally. You know, estrogen is required for breast function, first for breast development, and then for breast function when uh, each pregnancies. So what affect hormone levels then? Okay, so naturally in a woman, you have a reproductive factor, number of pregnancies. The more pregnancies you have, the less risk of cancer you have because you have been less exposed to estrogen during your life. So age of the first child is another one. Breastfeeding is another one. Age of first menstruation, the earlier, the more risk because you have been exposed to longer uh, time to hormones. And the age of menopause, the same thing, it works this way. But also, we come back to energy metabolism here because body weight. Body weight is a big factor because after, after menopause, when the ovaries stop working, what happens is that the main source of estrogen is no longer the ovaries, but it's fat. So the more fat that we have, that you have, the more fat, the more estrogen that you'll produce and the more exposure you'll get to the, uh, to the hormones. So that's why having overweight increases a lot of the risk of cancer. Also, too much alcohol or not getting enough exercise will alter the balance of hormone in your body, okay, in the, in the bad way. And naturally, you have external sources of hormones. And the main, some of the main ones, or two main ones at least in women, are hormone replacement therapy. <clears throat> and we know that uh, since that um, the very drastic reduction in the use of HRT back in from 2002 and on, uh, then there is a, a dramatic uh, uh, diminution now in breast cancer because women are less exposed to um, hormone uh, estrogen and progesterone. There's also the contraceptive pill that also is a mixture either of estrogen alone or estrogen and progesterone. And also there is less uh, evidence for that, but also it's, a, it's a <clears throat> naturally exposure to uh, uh, external source of hormones. And there is probably some people think that environmental chemicals but that's less proven that it can also could play a role. So finally, how can we block the action of, of these hormones? Especially in my specialty is the estrogen and the androgen. Okay? So how, how can we do that? So the, the work that we did in the last 20 years on these receptors led to a very deep understanding of how these receptors and hormones work, all the way to the molecular level where we can, in fact, figure out exactly how the receptor work. And the receptor work, in fact, like a mousetrap. Okay, so the receptor is open. When there is no hormones, the receptor is open, and there is this, this trap that's open, okay? And then what happens is that the hormone comes in, and when it comes in, it closes, and this is the mousetrap. And when it is closed here, it can interact with the DNA because it has a new surface here that's created, and that it can interact with other protein and tells the DNA to make protein, RNA and protein, and so on. So now that we understand that, we can, what, what we can then we do is to make drugs, because especially it's, very, it's much easier with small hormones like estrogen and androgen, because they are easily to synthesize. They're easy to synthesize and to, and to change. And you can change the shape of the hormone enough that it can still enter the, uh, the receptors, so it prevents estrogen, normal estrogen from the body to enter, because now you put a lot more of the drug. But then the, what the drug does is that it cannot, because it's a different shape, this, this piece, this central piece, cannot exactly fold together. It's a bigger piece, and then the trap cannot close completely. And now it cannot interact with DNA, or it cannot interact with other protein, and so on. And now the receptor become inactive. And this is how tamoxifen works. So this is tamoxifen, 
which is inside that, that, uh, that receptor here. And that's how it works. Okay? So this is how, I mean, very basic molecular biology work can lead to the understanding of how, 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 to, <clears throat> how to manufacture uh, new drugs and so on. The other way also that you can uh, change hormone levels is by interacting with the enzyme that makes the hormone itself. So if you can block the endogenous production of hormones, that's great as well. And this is how you can do it is, as well by, <clears throat> uh, like anastrozole is a, <clears throat> is a drug that again look like this, but instead of working on the receptor, it works on the enzyme that transform, that make the estrogen. And again, it's all these studies from many, many labs around the world, including here at McGill, that led to this kind of treatment. So this is in a nutshell what we know about hormone and cancer. Actually, there's a lot more to do, but you can see our basic research led to the development of very, very effective treatment against cancer, especially like prostate and uh, breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, you know, uh, in French, we say, uh, c'est pas reposant. If you have a bit of, uh, a bit more weight, I think, uh, Vincent, you stress us out totally. Um, and other things, if you have good friends, like, uh, recently I, I had, uh, Maurice Goodman was very kind to send me a bottle of whiskey after Christmas, and now I wonder what, what is. And then his wife, Rosalind, invited us for supper. So I, I don't know, with all of this, uh, it's a bit, uh, a bit scary. But, but we clearly see, though, that these basic fundamental things that we pass years to study, are uh, very important to understand. And now with Dr. Shore, which is also a professor in biochemistry for many years, he's also a member of the Cancer Center, he will give you an example of what to do when we go beyond these understanding. And he's one of the very unique individuals uh, that has done this translation research to the extent he's going to talk to you about. So thank you, Gordon. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Let's take a couple of minutes and uh, back up and uh, put fueling cancer um, metabolism or cancer growth into the overall context of, of cancer uh, biology. The past 25 years of basic research uh, in cancer has done an amazing job of discovering and elucidating the basic pathways and mechanisms that are used by a normal cell to convert into a cancer cell. And we've touched on a couple of these, but not all of them uh, so far tonight. One of the most important is the ability of a cancer cell to evade cell death. This is why cancer is, uh, one of the reasons why cancer is so difficult uh, to treat. Cancer cells are insensitive to signals from the body to stop growing, and conversely, they don't require signals from the body to proliferate because they carry their own uh, signals. We've, we've heard about uh, metastasis as one of the really lethal consequences uh, of cancer, and this is the ability of cells to migrate from the primary tumor to different locations within the body where they do a, a great deal of, of damage. Cancer cells are uh, amazingly effective at recruiting blood supply away from other sources uh, in the body so that they can really drive uh, tumor cell growth. Uh, cancer cells are immortal. They can basically replicate uh, as far as we know, as long as they need to, be, to, to, to replicate. In fact, cancer cells that were taken out of patients 70 years ago are still growing in laboratories uh, around uh, the world. So they basically have an immortal ability to, uh, to, to replicate. And then the rediscovery of a very old uh, concept, cancer metabolism, which is what uh, today's, uh, this evening's uh, discussion uh, is about. So 12 years ago, uh, Geminex Pharmaceuticals was founded by myself and a, and a colleague, uh, Phil Branton, with the specific goal to take some of these new discoveries in cancer biology and see whether we can't convert this understanding into a new generation of drugs that might be a more effective way of uh, uh, treating the disease in, in, in a more rational way compared to uh, standard uh, chemotherapy. And so 12 years later, and over $150 million spent, where are we? So we have, uh, in fact, uh, focused initially on uh, 
the ability of cancer cells to evade cell death to try to reinstate uh, this process uh, in, in, in cancer with a drug, and the, the drug that we conceived of and discovered and developed uh, at Geminex is a drug called uh, Obataclax. That's currently in a very large uh, clinical trial, which is being conducted throughout North America, uh, Europe, uh, and India. And a clinical trial is basically an experiment, an experiment uh, in, uh, in patients, which will tell you whether, in fact, a drug will, uh, will work uh, or not. GMX1777 is another uh, drug that was developed at uh, Geminex, and it targets uh, cancer metabolism. And then finally, uh, in preclinical development, a, a drug that uh, targets the ability of the cancer cell to uh, uh, effectively be immortal and have limitless uh, replication. So because tonight's focus is on um, cancer cell metabolism, I'm going to focus on GMX uh, 1777. But the way we got into cancer cell metabolism was through the evasion of uh, cell death. So really the story uh, starts there. So when a normal cell begins to initiate cancer signaling, that's actually a powerful signal for the cell to undergo a process of cell destruction called programmed cell death or uh, apoptosis. And so this is happening probably in most of us as we speak. One of our cells is going through this process. But when that happens, a death protein is activated, that initiates the death of that afflicted cell, and it dies, and therefore it's immediately removed from the organism, so the threat of initiating cancer uh, is taken away. The problem occurs, however, sometimes the cancer initiation pathway is activated in a cell that has a mutation that blocks the ability of the initiated cancer cell to undergo this self-destruction uh, mechanism. One of the main ways in which that can happen is through the induction of a protein called uh, BCL2. And if the cancer initiation occurs where there's an excess amount of BCL2, BCL2 can interact with this killer protein and prevent the cell from dying when the cancer initiation signals have been uh, uh, initiated. The cell then doesn't die, and all the subsequent processes that lead to cancer can uh, likewise uh, occur. And so our basic research over many years has been around this family uh, of proteins. And back in 1998, we and other people around the world reasoned that if you could come up with a drug that bound to BCL2 and prevented it from interacting with this killer protein, that in fact, that drug would allow now the cancer signaling pathway to drive cell death. And this cell death occurs in a very specific way. This programmed cell death or apoptosis occurs in a specific, very specific way. I've got a movie that hopefully will uh, show. These are two uh, cancer cells that uh, have been treated in a way that overcomes the ability of BCL2 to protect them from uh, cell death. And then they very rapidly undergo this funny form. It's the cell equivalent of a popcorn machine. But when the cell pops, that's actually a signal for other cells to come in. These are eat me signals. And other cells come in and digest these dying cancer cells and the threat to the, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, organism is, uh, is removed. And so there are other ways in which the killer protein that is effective for killing uh, cancer cells uh, which are uh, initiating uh, can also be uh, suppressed. And so Rusty Jones talked a little bit about the tumor suppressor protein P53, uh, which when activated in response to a cancer signal actually activates this uh, killer uh, protein so that the cell can undergo this process of, of programmed uh, cell death. And as Rusty mentioned, P53 loss occurs in a large number of cancers. And so in this context, if you have loss of P53, the killer protein is now inactive. And so again, you have the same problem as overexpression of BCL2, the cancer signal, can no longer drive the death 
of the cancer cell. If one wants to access this problem therapeutically, it's a real challenge. How do you deal with a protein that goes away? With BCL2, it increases. You can generate a drug against that protein. So how do you deal with a situation where there is a loss of a protein? We took a very bold and a very high-risk approach uh, to this uh, problem, and we reasoned that with loss of p53, there might be other complementary pathways. We don't know what they are, but perhaps we can access them through uh, drug uh, discovery. The high-risk nature of this uh, project, which was initiated about uh, six, six years ago uh, at Geminex, was to simply use as an assay the ability of compounds to induce this process of programmed cell death in cells which lack the p53 tumor suppressor. So you take tens of thousands of compounds, either compound libraries, which you screen in-house, or scoping the world looking for candidates that you think might fit this uh, uh, profile of inducing this uh, controlled form of cell death in these P50, P53 null uh, cells, and select a compound. You don't know how it works, but in order to effectively develop that compound, you've got to figure out how it works. And this is where the high risk and the challenge comes in, because for any compound, there are literally tens of thousands of potential targets or proteins within the cell in which, through which that uh, uh, compound uh, can work. And the challenge is that if you really want to effectively develop the drug, you've got to know what its target is. So talk about the needle in a proverbial uh, uh, haystack. The challenge is when you select a compound, you've now got to figure out how it works. And uh, the compound that was uh, finally selected was the active entity of that drug that I first mentioned, GMX1777. And after about three years of very hard work by a large number of scientists at Geminex in collaboration with uh, uh, people here at the Goodman and the biochemistry uh, department, uh, we were uh, successful. This is not a project that I would have initiated in the 1990s but in the 21st century with the advent of very sophisticated tools in genetics, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, uh, et cetera, et cetera, this was worth uh, undertaking. And it turns out that the drug we selected has only one target, one protein in the cell that it inhibits. And it turns out that that is a critical enzyme in the type of energy metabolism that we've been hearing about um, tonight. And so Rusty spent a lot of time talking about the incredibly sweet tooth that cancer cells have. They have a major need to take up a lot of sugar. And why do they have that need? Because that sugar is then converted into energy that fuels cancer cell growth. Well, it turns out that there is a critical cofactor called NAD, that is absolutely essential for the conversion of the sugar into the energy. And as you might predict, cancer cells, because they need so much energy, have a very significant dependence on NAD compared to uh, normal cells. And it turns out that GMX 1777, with exquisite potency and selectivity, inhibits the key enzyme that is responsible for synthesizing NAD. So that what this drug does is it turns off this factor so that glucose can no longer be converted into energy. And when that happens, the cancer cell can't sustain itself and it undergoes uh, programmed cell death. So in developing the agent now, because we understand its mechanisms of action, we can better understand how to rationally develop this agent uh, clinically. And for a lot of reasons that I won't go into, there were certain kinds of cancers that we focused on, and one of them 
uh, is brain cancer, a type of brain cancer called uh, glioblastoma. And there are genetic reasons why we focused on this uh, particular uh, cancer. And so in collaboration with uh, probably the largest brain tumor center uh, in the world, both treatment and research, at uh, Duke University, we were able to gain access to some pretty sophisticated animal models for this human uh, brain uh, cancer. And so the type of experiment uh, that is done and is illustrated here is to take tumor from a human patient, in this case, uh, childhood uh, brain tumor, and implant it into the brain of a, uh, a mouse uh, model. And so this is the brain excised from the mouse. This is the tumor that has been uh, implanted. And if you take a bunch of animals that have had this human tumor implanted uh, into the brain, uh, and you let those, you, you look at the survival, then after about 50 days, the first mouse dies, and then by 60 days, all of the mice are dead. If you take a set of animals and pre-treat them right here at the beginning with this new drug, then it's a very different outcome. There's a significant survival uh, benefit, an 80% survival benefit. This is a very, very stringent model. Very few experimental drugs work in this uh, stringent uh, model. And uh, for that reason, the physicians at uh, Duke University, this is where Ted Kennedy uh, was treated. The physicians at Duke University are pretty excited about uh, this agent and, and the possibility of starting uh, some clinical trials. And so based on a lot of uh, preclinical uh, studies and, and research, uh, we believe that we know where to go in terms of uh, the kinds of cancers to treat with this agent, at least in the early days. We uh, currently have, uh, we have two trials uh, that are open. These are early stage uh, clinical trials. And again, a clinical trial is, is simply an, an experiment that one does in, in uh, human patients. But very importantly, based on the basic research, we know that uh, glioblastoma, and because of genetics that I'm not going to be talking about, uh, this should be an effective uh, a cancer that uh, uh, might succumb to GMX1777. And for other reasons, combining this agent with radiation is also in a very effective uh, treatment uh, based on preclinical models. And so we'll be initiating a clinical trial in, in radiation uh, as well. So one example out of, we hope, many where uh, really understanding the basic research opens up opportunities and tools where rather than relying on uh, chemo uh, therapies in which basically you're looking for a small window where cancer cells uh, are killed and normal cells are uh, spared, uh, understanding these rational uh, approaches to the treatment of cancer where we understand the specific targets, why you're targeting it, the kinds of cancers that you're going into based on understanding that basic uh, mechanism hopefully will open up some new opportunities uh, in terms of treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gordon. So during the time that Michael's coming to, I hope you're not overwhelmed by the data here. And uh, Are we doing okay? Yeah? So uh, I'm glad because I know that there's a lot of things, years of research we're trying to that people are, are throwing at you in, in many different ways, so I think you're pretty good uh, and very patient. Yeah. I think it's, it's going well. So we're getting closer and closer to really the aim of all this research, which is clinical application. Uh, but Michael is a, a special individual. He's not only an oncologist, but he's been doing basic science in many different ways. Uh, he's, he's pushing us at the Cancer Center uh, in many different projects, and it's a wonderful opportunity to see him tonight. And Michael, thank you. In a, in a topic that you're very well known everywhere in the world. So uh, we'll leave the place to Michael Pollack. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to uh, be here. And um, I guess I'm the last speaker, so I can take advantage of all the uh, uh, knowledge that you've learned from the previous speakers. The time, not the time. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to... Uh, so I, if this works the way it should, some of the things I talk about should remind you of what you've heard from the other speakers. So uh, when we talk about energy and cancer, you might have noticed that there's two 
whole different playing fields. Some of us are talking about energy in the sense of how much we eat, the energy of the whole body. And others were talking about energy at the level of energy supply to individual cells. So instead of covering up that distinction, let's emphasize it. So uh, you know, here is an individual cell with all those mitochondria and all those things you talked about. It could be a cancer cell. And, and here are bodies. And the question is, do cancer cells care you know, if the host is hungry or how much you eat? So this child is one of those child's, children that are responsible for those maps that you saw, an obese child, an epidemic of obesity. And these are hungry children. But if these hungry children are so hungry and need energy so badly, and these people are overly fed, what about the cells in their bodies? Do, do these, are these kids cells running out of energy? And uh, are, are these fat people cells having too much energy? So let's look at this simple question this way. There's the host energy balance, how much you eat as compared to how much you spend. And then there's the cellular energy balance. And uh, the message that I want to give to you links with some of the other speakers because actually, surprisingly, host energy balance has very little influence on cellular energy balance unless you're actually dying. If you're dying of starvation, your blood glucose will be so low that your cells will not have enough. But if you're in any of us in this room, the changes in how we eat actually don't affect the amount of energy available to the cell. But they, it's very important, because what they do, the changes in the host energy balance, they change hormones. And then the hormones change the cellular behavior. So you've heard these themes earlier in the evening. It's, it's your cell phone. Oh, it's if my you cell phone. put your cell phone on the table, and uh, we'll answer that, especially for a raise from the dean. I mean, we'll, we'll take that out. <laughs> Great, thank you. Okay, so, so you understand now, the host energy balance can affect the tumor cells, not by affecting the cell's energy, but by affecting those hormonal sig uh, uh, signals that you heard about. And one of them is insulin. You may know that when you eat a lot, your blood sugar tends to go up, and then your body makes a lot of insulin that drives the blood sugar down, but the insulin has these other properties. So you've also heard about overweight, obesity, and cancer. And you know, this is one of the biggest studies that showed that really, the, the, if you are overweight, you really have a chance, not so much of having extra cancer, you have a bit of an increased risk, but the main point is that your probability of dying of cancer, if you get it, is higher. Look how important this is. This is just probability of prostate-specific cancer, de cancer death, if you have prostate cancer, over years, okay? So here is the normal person, okay? So the person, this is the kind of risk that you have if you're normal, black line. Remember, these are all prostate cancer patients. It's the risk of dying of your disease. The blue is if you're an obese prostate cancer patient, much higher. I want to emphasize the importance of this. The difference between these death rates is bigger than the effect of our best drugs. So uh, it's very profound how the prognosis of cancer is influenced by your weight. And some of the mechanisms that I've mentioned could be that the weight affects the hormones and then the hormones affects the prognosis. And we've been especially interested in insulin and insulin-like growth factors, which you've already heard about. And the take-home message is that insulin receptors and insulin-like growth factor receptors are actually present on the cancer cells. In this stain, the brown is insulin receptors. But even though this is kind of an obvious question, it wasn't recognized till recently that insulin receptors which we didn't think had a role in cancer, actually are present at very high levels on cancer cells. So, follow me with this. You eat too much, 
your body makes a lot of insulin. It makes a lot of insulin to lower your blood sugar, but the insulin can't help but interact with those receptors which could stimulate the cancer growth. So, we're going to spend a few words on this very simple old drug called metformin. Metformin is used in the treatment of diabetes, type 2 diabetes. It's one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the world. And you have to know a fact of background here. Even though we're thinking, many people think of diabetes as insulin deficiency, that's type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetics actually have very high blood sugars and also high insulin levels. And metformin is a drug that, amongst many other properties, lowers insulin levels. Now, these papers that came out recently are kind of shocking. And there have been a number of them from different investigators around the world. And in cancer research, everybody has an exciting story. But if you only hear the story once, you have to take it with a grain of salt. But we're seeing these stories pop up from Canada, from the UK, from France, from the US. People are doing surveys of diabetic patients. Diabetic patients who are on metformin for the purpose of treating their type 2 diabetes. And look what happens. Here are diabetic control patients who are being managed for some other way for their diabetes. Here are diabetics on metformin. So look at their new cancers and their cancer deaths. You see, in the controls, about 11% of these diabetics got cancer over the period of observation. That's fine. But the diabetics who were on metformin had only 7%. That's kind of a big difference. And cancer death rates were half. So this is a very interesting study in a kind of... Um, interaction between epidemiology or study at the population level and science at the laboratory level. Because we're finding that a drug that has something to do with energy and insulin, and in particular a drug that lowers insulin levels, is also lowering cancer deaths and cancer incidence. Here's another example, just to show you it wasn't just one study. I won't go over the slide in detail. The point I'm making is that, again, a different group showed that the same kind of relationship, that the diabetics on metformin are mysteriously getting less cancer than would be expected. And working with colleagues here at McGill and uh, elsewhere around the world, uh, and um, stimulated in part by work that Rusty and his colleagues did in, uh, you know, before he came here, we and others showed that when you actually put metformin on cancer cells in a dish, it acts in a growth inhibitory way. So metformin can do things at the level of the whole organism, that is to say, lowering the insulin levels, and that may be a way in which it benefits cancer patients. But in these experiments, where we see less cancer growth with increasing concentration of metformin, just when the cancer cells are growing in a dish, here the insulin levels are constant. So the metformin may be acting in a different way, because it couldn't be acting by lowering insulin levels. And again, I'm not some of these next slides I'm going to perhaps skip because they may be a little bit uh, technical and you've heard so many lectures, you might be eager to ask your questions. But again, I'll just say that metformin has been found to interfere with energy metabolism in the mitochondria in ways which I won't go into in great detail. And uh, I'm going to skip these next few slides because it's pretty technical. And I'm going to go on to show something that's a little bit easier to understand that gives other lines of investigation that lead us to suspect that this insulin connection may be important. Here's a study where we're looking at tumor growth in mice over time. And it's the same kind of tumors in red and in blue, but obviously these ones are growing faster. Now, what's the experiment? It's the same tumor, it's the same kind of mice, the difference was the diet. The faster growing tumors are growing in animals who were fed more sugar. 
And what we think is going on here is not that the sugar is directly stimulating the cancer by providing it with more energy. It's a reasonable idea, but we just don't think that that's true. What's happening is that the sugar is leading the animals to make more insulin. And then the insulin is stimulating the growth of the tumors. And I can, I won't go into it for lack of time, but the reason we reached that conclusion was because we actually saw that the insulin receptors were stimulated in the cancer cells. Now let's go back to metformin, and I'll close with these few slides. This just shows another of those examples where here a colon cancer is growing slowly, relatively speaking, in the green, and more quickly in the pink. And again, the different behavior is related to the different diet of the animals. These animals are eating junk food. These animals are eating uh, what we call a standard diet. Now, we give the animals metformin. Whether they're on the junk food diet or the standard diet, and we find something that is interesting and plausible. Here's the curve for the controls on the high energy junk food diet. When they get the same diet, but metformin, their growth is greatly reduced, shown by the dashed line. It's as if the metformin cancels the negative effect of the bad diet. When metformin is given to the animals on the other diet, on the standard diet, its benefits in this model are much reduced. So it seems that uh, you know, metformin is not going to turn out to be a panacea, but it seems that there are certain contexts where this kind of drug may have a role to play in adjunct treatment of some kinds of cancer. And where it will be useful will probably depend not just on characteristics of the specific tumor cell and how it uses energy, but also on characteristics of the host. In other words, maybe metformin will benefit obese cancer patients more than it benefits thin cancer patients. So I just wanted to close by showing again that in this line of research, working with people in Vancouver and elsewhere, the, these receptors are present in lots of cancers. And there's other treatments that are newer drugs than metformin that are showing some promise. These are drugs that block, I mean, Vincent told you about older drugs that are used to block estrogen receptors or androgen receptors for uh, uh, breast cancer or prostate cancer. Well, now we have drugs that block insulin receptors or insulin-like growth factor receptors. And here's one of them made by Pfizer, and, you know, it's early in its development, but blocking these kinds of receptors, you know, can result in significant tumor shrinkage. So I'll stop there, uh, and I hope that I've introduced you to the notion that this paradigm of energy utilization and fueling cancer by energy is intimately related to that hormonal context, and in some cases, the influence of whole organism energy metabolism on the tumor is mediated by effects on hormones. And in some cases, the effects of energy metabolism are dependent on cell-specific uh, issues. So perhaps you'll have some questions for me or other speakers. I guess that's the next item on the agenda. Thank you very much, Michael. So, uh, so I would like the uh, speakers to come in front. I, I thank all of you to have been very... Uh, Precise in your time, very appreciated, I'm sure, from, uh, for everybody. Uh, second thing before, the, when they take their, space, their pace, uh, please, uh, you have, in fact, uh, comments to be, if you have comments to be made on the evening, uh, there'll be somebody up on, on top and somebody in the bottom here to collect your comments. Uh, you have a form in your package. Uh, don't hesitate to uh, say good, bad, or ugly things. Uh, we will improve uh, our, uh, our evenings, uh, and your contribution on this improvement is very important. So with that, uh, now we have our panelists. I'm not sure if we can close this, maybe. Uh, I'll, yeah, I think.
I think it should close on its own. And uh, we have a gentleman there, and we have a second question here. Just a second. Uh, I am trying to see David Labbé, like there. David, would you be kind enough also to take the microphone after? And since you're here in Halpik, David, David is a PhD student in my lab. He was with, in fact, doing a master's degree with Richard Villiveau. So if you see Richard, tell him it's not broccoli, it's mitochondria, right? That's important. We know that now. So, but David, if you can help, that'd be great after the gentleman asks his question. Go ahead. Okay. I have a two-part question. I'll try to be very brief. Could you also tell, uh, tell us which person you want to, if you remember who, uh, well, you want him to answer? No, I'll, or? Leave, I'll leave that open. Perfect. That's fine. Okay. Given the strong survival instinct of all living forms and using the analogy of drug-resistant bacteria, what's to prevent cancer cells in the future from mutating so that they resist your attempts to interfere either with their food supply or their signaling patterns? That's the first question. That's the first question. My second question is the same idea on a historical basis. Obviously, Obesity causes all kinds of problems in addition to cancer. Yet historically, we've had cancer ever since mankind has been here, and for most of history, obesity was never a problem. So how do you explain the fact that cancer has been around for such a long time, despite the fact that we didn't have the obesity problem? So what is the increased risk of obesity as opposed to all kinds of other factors which also may be in affecting cancer? These are good questions. I'd like the second one to be answered by Michael. You can start with the first if Maybe you don't I'll mind. Start. Maybe I'll start with the, the first. I think the bacterial analogy is a, is just, a really... Just make sure you speak to the microphone. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So I think the bacterial analogy is a, is a great analogy, and the question of resistance is a, a huge problem. If you compare the average tumor... The average tumor actually acquires between 60 and 90 different mutations that actually contribute to the ability of the cancer cell to become a malignant uh, disease. There are likely initiating mutations, and for example, the evasion of cell death is probably one of the founding uh, mutations. But as the cancer cell survives and grows, its chromosomes are very pliable. They uh, have difficulty in repairing damage to the DNA, and that's basically the genesis of all of these mutations that you're talking about. So the, the challenge uh, historically um, in the face of these resistance mechanisms is to develop treatments that are effective enough that you uh, are able to treat the cancer patient, get them out of trouble as fast as you possibly can. Uh, and try to cure the, the patient from the, from, from the cancer. So you don't prolong the, uh, the treatment and the survival of the cancer cells to allow these mutations to, uh, to accumulate. And one of the, the real, one of the real problems with current treatment is that uh, so many of the, the chemotherapies themselves uh, are uh, cause damage to DNA, a perfect scenario for generating uh, mutations. Uh, the challenge with developing new drugs is that from an ethical uh, perspective and doing clinical trials, uh, you can only put new drugs into patients that have become resistant to uh, agents and they failed their, their treatment. So again, it's a, it's a perfect storm for cancer cells to have acquired mutations for, uh, for, for, for resistance. So it's, it's, it's a challenge, but I think that uh, as we develop more agents, that are specifically directed toward those pathways that are the true initiating events in uh, initiating uh, cancer, I think we have a, a, a stronger opportunity uh, in the future to get patient, uh, cancer patients out of, out of trouble a lot, uh, a lot sooner. So, so probably like multiple drug treatment at the same time, like antibiotics, like you mentioned, I think that's a good... It may happen in oncology. The second question, Michael, so uh, why is my Entrombly ancestors were leaner than me, for example? Okay. No, well, let's go very back very to briefly, your first question, I'll just make a quick comment, is absolutely the whole problem of cancer. Your average cancer patient has as many cells as there are people on Earth. So even a very rare cell that has a resistance, you know, could, could actually, if it's one in a billion, 
it still is going to be responsible for treatment failure. So that's why cancer is harder to treat than pneumonia. As far as your second question, well, the, to remind everyone, the second question was, if obesity is so important, why did we have cancer before there was so much obesity? Well, actually, we had much less cancer. So no one is claiming that obesity is the only factor or even necessarily the most important factor, but of all the adverse factors that we're subject to, it's the one that's increasing at the most alarming rate. We're not being exposed to more radiation, we're not being exposed to more carcinogens, but we are being exposed massively year by year to more obesity in the population. So it's important in that context. Uh, there was, uh, you know, as you point out, you know, even in non-obese populations, cancer can be a problem. But statistically, it's much more of a problem in populations where there's more obesity. Thank you very just much. Just very quickly, if yep. I may, for clarification. But one of the problems with obesity is not just simply the food we're eating, but the fact that we're doing less work, we're doing less activity. So who's to say that it is the food factor as opposed to the lack of exercise I'm factor? saying it's obesity. You can become obese by, by exercising too little. Yeah, I think a drink and staying on the couch, it's, it's, it's some advantage to that, but yeah, yeah, but certainly. So we have a question here. I think you had a question. Uh, you, I'll give you my microphone and I think David will go um, I think this is for Dr. Jaguer. Um, I have a teenager who's been a vegetarian almost all her life, so I feed her tofu and good amounts now of vitamin D because I've got to be careful about her bones. Now, I've just seen your, uh, your presentation and I'm thinking, what am I to think about uh, the food we eat that's supposed to be good for you with respect to your findings? Should I cut out the tofu? You know, should I reduce the vitamin D? What? No, no. Where, where am I to go? Where's a poor lay person to no, go? No, no, not at all. Because I mean, we all have teenagers, vegetarian. I have one in my case. But, uh, we'll try to answer not too long, so we can have no, more questions. Huh? Yeah, no. Yeah. No, no. I, I think the important thing is to eat a very balanced diet, and and in order. In, no, tofu is not a problem. And it, nothing is a problem until you eat too much of it. To, tofu could probably be a problem if you eat only tofu and a lot of it. But I think in every aspect of life, I mean, moderation is always what's needed. I mean, you need vitamin D for the bone. You need vitamin A for, for your eye. You need, you need all these things for normal growth and normal life, day-to-day -day maintenance of your organism. That's not the problem. It's, it's, what, what I explained is sometime when there is a cancer cells in the body, it will use those hormones to fuel their own growth. But until you have cancer, there is no problem if you eat normally the right thing at the right amount. So this is the short answer. I think. That's the message. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm having a tr trouble with the correlation between obesity and overeating. Dr. Pollock, you were talking about insulin and the effect of the, the insulin effect on cancer related to overeating because the insulin has to lower the blood sugar and therefore but it has an effect on cancer. What about people who have a metabolism where they're lucky never to gain weight or rarely to gain weight, but they overeat anyway? So is the problem really overeating or is the problem obesity? And a corollary question, once cancer is diagnosed, does starting a low sugar diet still have a substantive effect on the can a substantive effect on the cancer or is it actually too late at that point very good question uh, you can you can become a student in our laboratory anytime <laughs> uh, so the, the these are great questions and uh, I would say that to deal with the last concept first uh, the more advanced the cancer is you know in every cancer it's like a little ecosystem and the most aggressive cells replace the other ones. So that the idea of this hormone dependency, there's a critical time sort of in the middle of a cancer's history where the hormonal dependency is the biggest issue and gives us the biggest therapeutic opportunity to exploit the uh, hormonal dependence. As you've implied, a very advanced cancer in a very, you know, in a dying patient by that time, the cancer has so many mutations, it doesn't care about its hormonal environment. It's autonomous. Yeah, okay, that was one point, though, that, that you meant. Now, 
uh, in terms of early diagnosis and this question of obesity and how much you eat, if this model or if this hypothesis is true, the critical thing is really not how fat you are, it's not how much you eat, and it's not how much you exercise. It's how much all these interact to determine your insulin levels. And in ongoing clinical research, you know, we find that it's the insulin levels in the blood that are even more accurately predictive of bad outcome than obesity. And the reason that obesity is roughly correlated with bad outcome is that obesity is roughly correlated with the insulin levels. But there are few people, as you've guessed, who have high insulin levels but are not fat. And in those cases, it's as if they were fat. In other words, it's not the obesity per se, it's the hormonal consequences of obesity. Well, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to say whether it matters more if you get obese by exercising a lot but eating a huge amount as compared to, uh, you know, uh, other ways to get fat. It's all having to do with the balance of energy in and energy out. Uh, Michelle, maybe just a comment on your, your yeah, very quickly, your, your last comment about, you know, should a cancer patient eat less. Um, I think that the underlying mechanisms for the addiction to, to sugar that Rusty talked about, this massive dependence on, on sugar, is because the initiating events in cancer upregulate in a very massive way on the cell surface their ability to take in sugar. So the, the cancer cells become very, very competitive in terms of uh, being able to secure uh, the appropriate nutrients in competition with the rest of the, uh, the body. So the idea of, of trying to, to manage cancer through diet is probably a, a pretty challenging way to go. Thank you. There's one question in the back. Go ahead. Oui, bonjour. De, de, C'est pour uh, Dr. Giguère. Euh, J'aimerais savoir c'est quoi les chances de survie ou de récidive sur un cancer du sein inflammatoire versus euh, l'estrogène euh, si on conserve les, les ovaires ou l'utérus ou si on le retire. Oh. C'est vraiment une, une question très clinique que peut-être Dr. Pollack peut peut-être répondre mieux que moi parce que je ne suis pas un clinicien. Je pourrais donner des réponses, mais je pense que c'est mieux que les cliniciens le fassent. La question, c'est les cancers de, de, euh, inflammatoires oui. par rapport aux, aux autres cancers. Alors, les cancers, euh, il y a beaucoup de choses qui, euh, qui vont euh, contribuer à la réponse, mais en général, les cancers inflammatoires sont les cancers qui sont plus avancés, c'est-à-dire qu'ils sont plus autonomes, c'est-à-dire qu'ils ont, ils ont moins de besoins des hormones. Alors, en général, les, les cancers inflammatoires ont un prognosis euh, qui est pire que les hormones qui ont besoin des estrogènes. Ici, si je veux avoir des informations sur les recherches qui ont été faites sur les cancers inflammatoires. Je peux trouver ça où? Uh, vous pouvez uh, m'envoyer un email et je peux répondre en plus de détails. Merci. OK. For, for anyone who would like to answer it, um, is a cancer cell um, different than a cell which is in the same stage of uh, triggered division? Is it fundamentally different? And should we think about a cancer cell always on the verge of starvation, or it gets everything that it needs easily? I'll, I'll start with one quick sentence, but I'm sure everybody will want to uh, contribute. I think you heard uh, a moment ago the idea starving the cancer cell is, is a naive idea. I, I would agree. The idea that a cancer patient should not eat to deprive the tumor of energy is really wrong because the last thing that you're going to starve is the cancer cell. It's very competitive. Uh, you'll starve your liver, you'll starve your muscles, but the cancer cell will be the last thing that will suck the glucose out of your blood. So you can't, you can't do it that way. And so the question is, is a, can is a cell at the verge of starvation, and I would say that energy is in general not limiting for cancer cells because of the fact that they've acquired this adaptive advantage at sucking nutrients out of your blood. But at certain stages of cancer development, as we've heard, 
there are other Achilles heels. At certain stages, they do really require the hormones. And sometimes these agendas get mixed because some of the hormones that they require are hormones that are related to your energy intake. So early on, you may actually decrease your cancer risk by eating less. But that's not because you're starving the cancer, it's because you're lowering your insulin levels. And the cancer may want insulin more than it needs energy. Mm -hmm. I think Julie wants to add to this. No, Talk to the phone, please. Oh. Not the phone, the microphone. Yeah, so some types of cells differently like are different. For example, like I work with breast cancer cells. And if you take a normal cell and a breast cancer cell, you could see like, I agree with Dr. Paul. Like they would fight their energy level like that. They would try to preserve that. So they would maintain their ATP level. It's just the way they achieve that is very different. As Rusty mentioned in his talk, it's just these breast cancer cells that I work with, they would rely heavily on glycolysis to maintain their energy, whereas normal cells normally would, you know, fight for their energy level with their mitochondria. But yes, they would do everything they can to preserve their energy level. I don't think they're starved in that way, but it's just how they get there is very different. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question there, and I'll bring the microphone to you after. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. At 8.30, we'll, we'll stop. So, uh, we got a third one after. Go ahead. Uh, quick question. When, Dr. Jones, when you said that cancer cells in, increase the nutrient intake, is that why, um, is that why people lose weight, like, when they have cancer? The, the process that you're talking about is cachexia, and that's sort of a, a wasting syndrome. And I think this is still debated quite widely as whether or not it's actually cancer cells that basically hoard nutrients away from the rest of the body or whether or not it's a more global inflammatory effect. But it is a, one, one theory that is, uh, is being considered. And uh, one more quick question. Um, you know how you were talking about how cancer cells become addicted to sugar? Does that translate on a behavioral level? Like, do you see people actually craving sugar, or is it just two different things? Or um, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to talk to my students when they work late at night and read the vending machine. But um, what I think is two different things. I think uh, Dr. Pollack actually covered this quite well, is that there is actually a disconnect between your whole body metabolism that's the way your body manages blood sugar versus something that a cell needs. And I think the important thing to think of is that even though a cancer cell will use more sugar, the actual amount of sugar in your bloodstream doesn't change because this is a very, very tightly regulated system. It's your liver, um, the gluconeogenic process in the, in the liver, as well as uh, the pancreas, which helps... Um, uh, sugar uh, to be absorbed from the bloodstream it really actually keeps your blood sugar at a very, very even keel. So unless you're a diabetic, this is where you'll have uh, fluctuations in, in sugar levels. So um, itself, the cancer cells, despite the fact they will use more sugar, the body will respond by maintaining your blood sugar levels. Thank you. I think there's another one already there. We'll go there this, after this, and I'll come to see somebody ask me. No, no, ah, no, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this question is not directed at any one panelist, but uh, basically my question is, are there any uh, selective blockers for insulin receptors on cancer cells? In other words, what I'm really asking is, are insulin receptor cells on cancer cells the same or identical to the ones on normal cells? Uh, well, there, this is, you, so we've taken you up, you know, in this evening from research that started hundreds of years ago to research that's happening now. And so blockers for the insulin receptors on cancer cells are, are real, and they've just been synthesized. And uh, Bristol-Myers is one of the companies that's working on that. Now, the insulin receptors on normal cells and on cancer cells are the same. So they're very scary drugs to use because you're worried about blocking the normal effects of insulin on the normal insulin target cells. But there's something that was good luck in the early clinical trials, which is that the, although these drugs are equally potent at the normal insulin receptors on the normal cells and the same insulin receptors on the cancer cells, it seems that the drugs are not taken up for pharmacokinetic reasons in muscle or fat. So that therefore, just by the way the drugs are distributed, they selectively tend to block the tumor insulin receptors. 
but this is research that's like about four weeks old. So it's, it's a very early result. <laughs> Dr. Shore, this question's for you. Um, for the cells that, uh, sorry. F for the cells that don't kill themselves, um, or the bad, the mutated cells that don't die, um, the Geminex drug that's in trial right now, you said that it would be an overexpression of, of the BCL2 protein. Does that mean that people who could be tested for an overexpression of this would be the people, or would everybody overexpress this protein to, to so not? So, so it's really a question around personalized medicine if one can identify uh, patients that overexpress this protein and that's the, the cause of the cancer, are those patients more likely to respond uh, to the drug? Um, it turns out that that's the principle that we're all going after. But when I talked about BCL2, it's really a family of over 20 proteins and uh, becomes very complex and, and uh, there's a lot of work notwithstanding the fact that it's very complex. There's a lot of work that is going on that addresses exactly that question using what is called biomarkers uh, in patients to try to profile uh, tumors in which um, uh, there would be a, 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 a dependence on the BCL2 family and therefore a prediction that this drug would be more effective in those patients versus uh, other patients. Thank you. Have a question here. Uh, good evening. I just want to be sure that I understand the, the themes tonight was that high levels of insulin or uh, hormones will promote growth in cancer cells. So I think that I understood. But that's once the cancer has appeared. How does it, what's the impact of high level of insulin in the body and hormones on creating cancer or developing cancer? Does that have an impact? That's question number one. And question number two is, how much should we be tested? Uh, I'm, as a thin person that has, I think, a healthy habit, should I not be tested for my insulin level and my hormones? Well, let me take that on at the first. Uh, I'm glad, because everybody else back up after <laughs> this question. <laughs> I think, I think. I, I, I should tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. I think, I think we, the first point that you have to understand is that this evening is to tell you a lot of established facts, and it's also to give you an uh, introduction into ongoing research. I don't think any of us would claim that any of what we talked about is necessarily like standard of care in clinical medicine. You know, there's a lot of work that has to be done to go between this level of early research understanding and recommendations of what the general practitioners should do in their office. So right now, you know, we have this idea that maybe one day people who are concerned about their cancer risk should measure their insulin levels. But that's not a public health recommendation. This is research that's in progress. Now, in terms of your other question, this is a question that's a much more complicated one than it seems. Because you're asking about the difference between early carcinogenesis, creating cancer, and cancer progression. The hormonal factors that we've all talked about, almost, you know, the majority of scientists would believe that the hormones do not damage DNA. They do not actually cause the first event. But many of us have cancers that, that we never know about because they're so well behaved. And they never grow for many reasons. One of the reasons could be that they need hormones that they don't have. And so most people would say that the hormonal influence is not for the first event that makes a normal cell car uh, cancerous, but maybe more for which of the cancers that occur at a one cell level become clinical disease. That's where the hormones play a role. Incidentally, did you know that most men and women have prostate and breast cancer. If you do autopsy series in uh, car accident victims, more than half women who are 60 years old will have real cancer in their breasts. It's just never acted up. It stayed at a tiny subclinical level. 
maybe because it needed a hormone that it didn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've been talking about hormones and insulin and uh, obesity being, uh, you know, contributing to cancer growth. But what about age? Um, I know um, one of the types of cancer that is usually staged uh, through by age is also, like, for example, thyroid cancer. Uh, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of information which states that, you know, if, if you have that kind of cancer and you're less than 45, your prognosis is better than if you're over 45. So how does age play as a factor in the, prolif in, you know, in, in, in the prognosis of such type of cancer? So living a long time is a risk factor for cancer. <laughs> Statistically, because you accumulate more years, but through the age process of acquiring damage, being exposed to carcinogens, to radiation, uh, et cetera, over a longer period of time, being uh, uh, less resistant to uh, the ability to, uh, uh, to, 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 to overcome some of these mechanisms. I mean, Cancer historically has been a, a disease of the of the age, and we're seeing it migrate into into earlier populations, younger populations, um, uh, more recently, uh, probably as a consequence of the the types of stresses that do cause cancer are are, are more profound now than they have been uh, historically. No, I just wanted to add that. That the age factor is also, I think, usually when young people have cancer, it's because they have somatic mutation, which is uh, a mutation that you already carry since birth, you know. And so, and usually those mutations are, are very effective at, at, at making cancer happen. So that's why, and usually they are worse cancer, because also they, they have time also to accumulate mutation every, since the beginning of life. So this is another uh, aspect of age and uh, and cancer. Um, I, I'm just trying to uh, see if I understand. I know there's been recent research also in the question of starving um, a cancer or starving cancer cells uh, via blood and uh, new uh, drugs working on that side that seems to starve the cancer uh, stopping the blood, or I, I'm not quite sure how the interaction is. But is that, in fact, uh, occurring, that the another approach is to try and starve it? And is the result of that taking energy away, or is it reducing the the sugar, or is it being fed through the blood for another reason? Well, the... The, uh, the idea, I think you're referring to anti-angiogenic types of therapies like Avastin that, that, take a, that, that delay the development of new blood vessels that grow into cancers in an attempt to, that the, that the, and these blood vessels bring everything that the cancer needs, nutrients, oxygen, and so on. And by impairing the new blood vessel development, these treatments uh, seek to deprive the cancers of everything they need, including energy. Uh, but those cancers are so good at getting even what they need if the supply is cut down that drugs like Avastin, although they're a step forward, they're really a small step forward. I mean, they don't give years of extra life. They give months of extra life. A few uh, quick but, comments. But, but you will recall that, you know, my earlier first comments were on the, 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 the pillars, the hallmarks of cancer, and, and you'll recall that blood supply was, was one of them. And uh, not only is you know, the usurping of the blood supply delivering nutrients, but it's also getting rid of uh, byproducts that uh, the tumor generates upon, uh, upon growth. But, uh, you know, Dr. Pollock is, is correct. Avastin has not been the, the magic bullet that we had hoped it would be, and in fact announced in the New York Times by a Nobel laureate about 10 years ago that, you know, cancer was beaten. And uh, it's just one more example of, uh, um, I think, how one needs a lot of humility in, in terms of approaching this, uh, this problem. But the Avastin 
question of limiting blood supply in combination with one of those other pillars of uh, cancer uh, development is the way in which people are, are thinking. So rationally combining agents so that separately they may not be particularly effective. But when you put them together, you get an enormous uh, uh, cooperation and synergy is, is something that a lot of people are thinking about. And one of the consequences of, of the kind of research that, that we're all doing is that it opens up opportunities where one can rationally take some, some agents that originally proved not too effective, but in combination with something else will, will prove to be, uh, you know, uh, something that, it, that is very important. Thank you very much. So last two questions. We have one from Mr. Goodman and one from Mr. Cole. So we'll start. Uh, Mr. Goodman has... Uh, okay, so uh, Mr. Cole, I'm re reaching you. Can we pass this microphone there? Can you? Thank you very much. And we'll finish with the last word with... Thank you. Um, Dr. Shore, you mentioned uh, your company had, had spent $150 million in the last 12 years. What's the average cost of bringing a drug to market? So uh, the average cost of bringing a new agent in oncology is currently around $800 million. The failure rate in oncology is astounding. Uh, last week at the J.P. Morgan conference in San Francisco where a lot of companies and researchers come to, together to, to discuss this. We were in conversation, this is public knowledge, so I, I don't think I'm divulging anything, but in a conversation with um, Pfizer, Pfizer spends 20% of its research budget in oncology, and oncology generates only 3% of uh, the profits. But in the last 11 phase three clinical trials that Pfizer conducted in oncology, and phase three clinical trials are hundreds, sometimes thousands of patients, and it costs about $50,000 a patient in order to put them into a trial. So you, you can do the math. The last 11 failed. So the, um, the challenge in oncology is astounding. And one of the, uh, the, the hopeful benefits coming in the future is through the kinds of research that we're all talking about that we can figure out at a much earlier stage um, how to develop these agents so that they in fact become uh, something that will ultimately benefit, um, uh, benefit uh, patients. And, and, I, and I think that the, the underlying challenge here is to recognize that cancer isn't just a single disease. Cancer is in fact uh, probably a hundred different Diseases. So if you have chronic myelogenous leukemia versus acute myelogenous leukemia, it's a different disease. And, and, and the reason it's a different disease is because there's a different mechanism which is driving the, uh, uh, the initiation and the promotion of that disease. And, and we have now very strong proof that when you get it right, that when you actually target the mechanism, and that mechanism is the dominant mechanism that drives uh, the cancer, and the best example of this is in chronic myelogenous leukemia, where a single genetic mutation, the BCR ABLE uh, mutation, uh, initiates and contributes to the promotion of that disease. Uh, Novartis developed a, a very famous compound called Gleevec, which I'm sure many in the audience uh, recognize, and that agent very specifically and very effectively uh, targets the BCR ABLE. And because that's the, uh, the mechanism that's driving uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia, that was a disease that historically had a very high death rate. And today, people uh, who take Gleevec have a very, very high probability of being, of being um, uh, cured uh, for, uh, for life. So the challenge is understand the mechanism, and what's really driving each one of these cancer uh, diseases and try to figure out from a, a drug perspective how you, how you treat it effectively and, and rationally. Thank you. Boris. I found this lecture very informative, and I want to thank the panel for their stimulating and um, enlightened speech tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're stealing, uh, you're stealing my words here. Thank <laughs> you.
Indeed, uh, I'd like to thank the panels. Thank you for being there. Uh, I've uh, kept your time. Uh, I'd like also to thank many people which contributed. The, the volunteer that organized this, Dale Borman, Ella Boro, Beverly Bratt, Ann Glassman, Rosalind Goodman, Sheila Nutkin, Annette Novak, Barbara Rosenthal, Karen Simon, and A.V. Uditsky, which have been wonderful work. I'd like to thank Sarita Ben Shimol, also people at the office that work uh, uh, very, very much on our side. And I thank you all for being here tonight. And, and uh, uh, Guylaine, of course, Guylaine has done quite a lot. And I welcome you for food if you still have an appetite for this after this evening. So have a safe journey home. Enjoy the evening. Bye-bye.